Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, my name is Talia Gershon, and my talk today is going to be about developing next generation solar energy materials. So I'm sure it comes as no surprise to anyone that by 2040, it's expected that global energy demand will rise. And it's expected to rise about 40% uh, by 2040. And by that time, about 15 to 33% of all energy generation is predicted to come from renewable technologies like wind, photovoltaics, hydroelectric, and some others. Um, what's interesting, um, if you compare wind energy to hydroelectric energy, both of those technologies re uh, rely on the turning of a turbine coupled into an electric generator to convert mechanical energy into electrical energy. For a lot of people, photovoltaics is more of a black box because there's no visible moving parts. So I'm going to spend a couple of slides now talking a little bit about how photovoltaic devices work. So we start with a semiconductor. A semiconductor contains a series of filled electronic states. These are called the valence band. And then separated in energy at higher energy states are the conduction band. So the valence band and conduction band are separated by an amount of energy known as a band gap. And if you shine light on a semiconductor, then it will absorb the light and use that energy to promote electrons from the valence band to the conduction band. And if we can collect those electrons, uh, we can generate a current. So current is the flow of charge per unit time. So if we can collect the electrons, we can generate a current. And if we can keep the electrons at this higher energy state, we can generate a voltage, because voltage is a measure of electric potential energy. So if we create a voltage and a current, we'll produce electric power from the optical power, which is the light. So in order to separate these carriers, we have to have an electric field. In the absence of an electric field, even though we'll absorb the light and promote these electrons to this excited state, they'll just decay back down to the ground state unless we can have an electric field separate these carriers. So the way we create an electric field is we use a material science trick that we call a PN junction. And so I'm going to uh, describe what that is using silicon as uh, an example. So silicon is an elemental semiconductor. It has four valence electrons. And by bonding with four nearest neighbor silicon atoms, sharing an electron in each one of those bonds, we can satisfy the octet rule. So basically, silicon can have eight valence electrons um, in, its, in its full octet. And this is a stable bonding configuration. So if we replace some of the silicon atoms in the structure with boron, boron sits to the left of silicon on the periodic table. And it has one fewer valence electron. So every time a boron atom occupies a silicon site, we have the absence of an electron, so it's not a full uh, stable octet. It's actually got one fewer valence electron. And this creates a free hole. And this hole can de uh, delocalize throughout the structure. And these free holes uh, make this material p-type for positive type. Similarly, if you replace some of the silicon with phosphorus, phosphorus sits to the right of silicon on the periodic table. It's got one extra valence electron relative to silicon. So in addition to satisfying the full octet, it now has an extra valence electron. And this electron can delocalize throughout the structure creating what's called an n-type material for a negative type. An important point to note about these materials is that they're not charged. So even though we've created this set of delocalized carriers, these carriers make the material more conductive because they're delocalized. But the material's not charged because of the difference in nuclear charge. For example, phosphorus, even though it contains one more valence electron, it also has one more proton in its nucleus. So phosphorus doped silicon isn't charged. So we take these two neutral materials. We put them together. And what happens when we do that is some of the uh, electrons in the n-type material will diffuse across the junction into the p-type material, which when this happens, we create what's called a depletion region. So we've locally depleted the free carriers near the interface of their free carriers. Um, and so we've created this electric field by uh, having a remainder of uh, the charged nuclei on either side. And the remainder of uh, the charge uh, without the free carriers creates this electric field. So the schematic I'm showing on the right is the minimum number of layers that are required to form an actual photovoltaic device. So we, cre we create a PN junction, and then we've got two electrodes, one at the top and one at the bottom, where the top electrode is transparent to allow the light to penetrate into the absorbing layers. So how do we measure performance? So we have to have some standardized amount of light that we shine on our photovoltaic device. And I'm showing you a uh, standardized solar spectrum. This is known as the AM 1.5 spectrum. And this is basically the. Um, optical power reaching the Earth from the sun at every, at every wavelength. And so we take this standard spectrum, which has about 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared of optical power, which is going to be incident on our device, and we measure the power out. So here's a, a relationship for power conversion efficiency. And as we discussed at the bidding, beginning of the presentation, when you have uh, the creation of a voltage and a current, you can create uh, electrical power. So um, the way that we measure this is we apply a varying voltage we measure the current response of the device 
and we can extract parameters known as the short circuit current density, the open circuit voltage, and the fill factor as indicated in this plot. And when we multiply those parameters together, we have the output power, we compare that to the input optical power from the sun, and we can get a power conversion efficiency. So the materials that are typically used um, in these devices on the market are predominantly crystalline silicon, so about 91% of all photovoltaic devices are made with silicon. And the rest of the devices are made with thin film technology. So one key difference between these technologies is that crystalline silicon is made by slicing wafers of silicon, which are hundreds of microns thick. You have to grow large, uh, large crystals of silicon. And this is a rather expensive process that requires a lot of equipment uh, costs. Thin film technologies, the different layers in the device are just coated sequentially onto um, any substrate uh, that you like to use. And so there's a lot of interest in this technology because it has the potential to be lower cost than silicon. And some of the key uh, materials that are used in this technology are listed uh, here, cadmium telluride and CIGS being the two key uh, commercial materials for this application. So some applications of photovoltaics, many of you have seen uh, rooftops in your communities with photovoltaic panels on them, so there's a residential application. And there's also utility scale power plants uh, made of uh, solar panels, so you create large arrays of silica, silicon or thin film uh, modules, and you can create uh, many megawatts of power um, with these arrays. And you can also integrate photovoltaics into consumer products so that you have a portable power source for various electronic applications. So you might be wondering how we go from an elemental semiconductor like silicon to a more complex structure like CIGS. And so thinking back to the uh, key requirements for the semiconductor, you have to have a stable octet of electrons. So in the case of silicon, it's got four valence electrons and it's bound to other silicon atoms. But you can envision various compound semiconductors where you combine various materials with different valence states, and as long as you satisfy the octet rule, you can form a stable bonding configuration. So you can go from silicon to say 3,5 materials like gallium arsenide, and gallium arsenide has been used in high efficiency solar cells, albeit more expensive, so they're not as commercially uh, available. And you can go further out to cadmium telluride, and in this case, between the cadmium and tellurium, the sharing of electrons allows the, the filling of a stable octet, and you can have a stable bonding configuration. And you can get even more complex by going from cadmium into copper and indium. So instead of having two cadmiums and two telluriums filling two stable octets, you have one copper, one indium, and two selenium, and you still satisfy the bonding requirements. And you can get increasingly complex um, as long as you're satisfying these bonding conditions. So cadmium telluride and CIGS, as we mentioned earlier, are the two key commercial materials for this uh, thin film technology, but there are some limits to how scalable these materials may be in the future. Um, in the case of cadmium telluride, tellurium is one of the least available elements in the Earth's crust. And cadmium is toxic, so there's a limit to um, the, the applications of this technology. CIGS has a similar um, constraint regarding materials availability, especially because indium is one of the key components in display technology, and gallium is not uh, mined as widely as, for example, copper. So there's been a lot of interest in developing materials to replace cadmium telluride and CIGS with something more uh, earth abundant. So there was a paper published in 2009 this is a figure from that paper, identifying candidate materials with which we could potentially replace um, CADTEL and CIGS. And so the materials were plotted on these axes, and the assumption that was made is that we're going to eventually be able to achieve uh, the efficiencies that are comparable to um, the theoretical limits for the different materials. And so they're plotted on two axes. One axis is the cost axis. So the x-axis represents cost, with negative cost being in the positive x direction. And the y-axis represents material availability. So you really want to be in the upper right-hand quadrant of this plot because you want to be low enough cost and high enough availability, and all these materials were compared against crystalline silicon, which is right at the origin. And you can see where CIGS and cadmium telluride fall. So we really want to be um, in this earth abundant uh, category. And so one of the materials on this plot is this material copper zinc tin sulfoselenide, CZTS. And we get to this material, as we mentioned in the previous slide, by substituting all of the indium and gallium with the more abundant zinc and tin uh, elements. So uh, here at IBM, we pioneered the state-of-the-art 12.6% conversion efficiency with this technology, and so then the rest of my slides are going to talk about specifically this technology and some of the things that are important for reaching uh, high performance and high efficiency with this technology. So what does this look like? So this is a picture. We grow these uh, samples on an inch-by-inch -inch glass substrate, and on that substrate we coat all the different device layers that are needed. 
and here's a cross section. So you can see the bottom uh, electrode on top of the glass is molybdenum. And on top of the molybdenum, we place CZTS. CZTS is intrinsically p-type because of the native defects that form in the material. And cadmium sulfide is used as the n-type heterojunction partner. So as opposed to silicon, where you can make silicon either p or n-type, depending on which impurities you introduce into the structure, in this case, we're using two different materials, each of which is intrinsically either p or n-type to form our junction. And then we're coating the device with an ITO zinc oxide top electrode, which is transparent. So this really um, exemplifies the thin film concept. Here I'm showing you an absorber that's only about 600 nanometers thick. And we can be anywhere from about 600 nanometers to two microns thick for thin film technologies like this. And so the next couple slides are gonna be about um, different things that impact the performance of this type of uh, device. So here I'm showing you a schematic of the crystal structure of CZTS. You have planes of copper and tin alternating with planes of copper and zinc interspersed with layers of selenium. And it's been experimentally shown that along the copper zinc plane, we happen to have a lot of disorder. So copper and zinc are very chemically similar to each other. The atomic size is very similar. They differ in covalent radius by only about 5%. And as a result, when we process these uh, samples at elevated temperatures, we end up getting a lot of disorder in this plane. And because copper and zinc have different valence states, every time we substitute a copper site with a zinc atom, we're electrically disturbing the area around that site. So instead of having a valence of one on the copper site, we have a valence of two when that happens. And so these electrical disturbances turn out to be detrimental to the performance, which is not that surprising. And so we really want to understand that phenomenon. And so we probe it using a technique called photoluminescence. So photoluminescence is a technique where we shine light on the semiconductor. We excite um, the electrons in the valence band into the conduction band. And when they decay back down, they give off photons. And if you have a perfect semiconductor, you expect the emitted photons to have energy on the order of the band gap. When you have a highly defective semiconductor, you can have, after the electrons are promoted into the conduction band, you can have the carriers interact with all these different charged states inside of the material, and then the light that gets emitted is different in energy from the band gap, usually lower in energy than the band gap. So if we analyze this lower energy light, we can gather information about the uh, defect structure of the material and also the disorder present in our, in our semiconductor. So if we fit our data to some models, we can actually extract a rough prediction of the defect density. And this plot is showing basically what happens to the device efficiency as a function of defect density. So unsurprisingly, when you go to higher defect density and worse atomic ordering, you have a reduction in the overall device performance. And this is obviously detrimental. The other interesting observation is that this defect density seems to be related to the actual composition in the semiconductor. So this is a plot along the x-axis of the copper to zinc ratio. And on the y-axis, I'm showing the defect density. So it turns out that if you go to the perfect stoichiometry, copper 2, zinc 10, sulfur, selenium 4, you actually have worse ordering than if you go into a, a situation of having copper poor and zinc rich stoichiometry. So in order to suppress some of the defects, we tend to grow devices, uh, device materials in a copper poor and zinc rich regime. And this is consistent with empirical observations that it turns out that devices made with copper poor and zinc rich CZTS materials tend to work better than the stoichiometric materials. Another important parameter is the microstructure. So the way we grow these materials is we co-evaporate copper, zinc, tin, and sulfur or selenium. And then we heat treat the sample to coarsen the grains and get uh, large grain microstructure. So this is a, a cross section of what we have before we do the heat treatment. And this is a schematic, uh, a cross-section of what you have after the heat treatment in the absence of sodium. So sodium turns out to be a very important player in the microstructure. Here I'm showing what happens if you don't have any in the sample. And what happens is you get spherical grains of CZTS, and along all the grain boundaries, we have zinc sulfide. The reason we have this zinc sulfide is because we grew the film zinc rich. So as the grains grow, they're expelling zinc, and the zinc is moving to the grain boundaries. But they're getting stuck at the grain boundaries. And one of the ways we know that is we can measure the zinc depth profile in the sample using a technique called SIMS, secondary ion mass spectrometry. And this was performed by Marco Hopsek in here at IBM. And you can see that the zinc uh, profile is relatively constant throughout the film. So the, the zinc isn't accumulating really at the front or back. It's present everywhere, and it's present along the grain boundaries. But when we add sodium for the same composition absorber, when we add enough sodium, we're able to actually grow the CZTS grains to be very large. And all of the zinc sulfide segregates towards the back of the foam. 
And you can tell that that's, those grains at the bottom are zinc sulfide because when you look at the SIMS profile, you can really see a reduction in zinc throughout the bulk of the absorber and an accumulation of zinc towards the back of the foam. So what sodium is doing is it's enhancing grain growth in CZTS, and it's doing that by unpinning the zinc from all the grain boundaries and allowing it to accumulate at the back. And we think that that phenomenon is associated with a sort of liquid type phase, sodium zinc sulfide liquid type eutectic phase, which forms at the temperatures we use to heat treat these samples. And that's really important for getting these large grain films. Sodium also improves all of the device metrics. So in addition to improving the microstructure, it's also improving the short circuit current, open circuit voltage, and fill factor of these devices, which overall results in improvement in efficiency of about 25%. So in addition, even after we have this microstructural change, a continued increase in sodium induces various electrical effects inside of the CZTS, which all result in enhanced device performance. So finally, I want to talk a little bit about non-uniformity and non-reproducibility. So over time, we've grown a variety of CZTS devices that have had varying performance. So here I'm showing a scatter plot of JSC values that we've measured in various CZTS devices over time. And so one question is, what's the reason for the variability in JSC? And is it because every point throughout the sample is producing a different amount of current, or is there more uh, variability? Is there more higher standard deviation? So in order to answer these questions, we performed Elbic mapping, light beam induced current mapping. So what this measurement does is it rasters a, a laser over the sample and it measures the current generation point by point throughout the sample over 500 micron steps. So this allows us to probe um, point by point how, how, how different um, the, the sample is generating current throughout the, throughout the actual device. And what we see is that um, not only are the actual um, point by point currents that we measure higher for the higher performing devices, there's actually a higher standard deviation in the higher performing devices. And this was, not, this was a very surprising result. So it turned out that the samples that had the highest current generation also had the highest non-uniformity of current generation. So the highest standard deviation in the Elbic measurement. And so one question becomes, what's the cause of this non-uniformity and what's the cause of this standard deviation? And so remembering back to the previous few slides about the role of sodium, we wondered whether there was a non-uniform sodium distribution everywhere throughout the CZTS sample. And when we did SIMS mapping, locally measuring the, the sodium concentration over the same step size as the current variability, we really found that there was a difference in sodium content in different regions throughout the sample. So there were local current hotspots at the same kinds of, um, kinds of points as the local sodium hotspots. And we were trying to understand, you know, what's the origin of this variability in the sodium concentration? And then we came back to the fact that we're growing the, the whole device stack on a glass substrate. So glass itself contains sodium. And when we go to heat treat the sample, if there's variability in the composition of the glass substrate, variability in the sodium content throughout the glass, that can translate itself into variability in the sodium content throughout the absorber. And we think that's the origin of this non-uniformity. So if there's regions of better performance that are correlated with some, con some dose of sodium in that spot, what we want to be able to do is just apply that dose of sodium everywhere throughout the absorber and we'll improve the overall performance of the device. So in summary, CZTS is a very interesting technology with a lot of uh, materials, challenges, and opportunities. And if we can solve some of the barriers to performance and make it competitive with SIGs and CADTEL, this could really reach terawatt levels of scalability. But still, we face the problem of the bulk defects in the absorber, and these seem to really be the limiting factor for performance. So these are really what we need to target if we want to push this technology forward. And with that, I'd like to thank um, all the collaborators who uh, participated in these experiments, and thank you very much for your attention.